Time now for sports on 104.7 The Cave. Here's Ned Reynolds. Mike, the intern, Ned Reynolds, back in the studio, chopping away at the work week. So we got uh, some big games coming up this Saturday in college football, don't we? These are especially big because next week, and I believe the date is November 1st, begins the first of the college football bowl rankings. These are the official rankings. This is from where the bowl teams are taken and where the final four teams for the national championship are uh, solicited from the committee that puts them together. So this week is very important. And you have, right from the very start, a trap game. Ohio State, one of the top teams in America, undefeated, number two in the nation, goes to University Park, Pennsylvania. Now, University Park, folks, is right in the middle of the state. It's really kind of a rural setting, but it is the home for Penn State University. And their stadium, Beaver Stadium, seats a cool 106,000 fans, and it is intimidating. Of course, Ohio State's used to that. Their stadium, Ohio Stadium in Columbus, also seats that same number. This will be a very loud crowd. Ohio State listed as a 15-and-a-half-point favorite. Hey, these are chocolate chips, folks, on this one. Give or Take those points and go with Penn State in this one. I think they beat that spread. I don't think they'll beat Ohio State, but 15-and-a-half points is a lot to give up. TCU, which is having a great year. Texas Christian plays at West Virginia. Another fascinating matchup is at the Carrier Dome in Syracuse, New York. And that's been the home for Syracuse football for many, many years. It is inside. Huge place. It seats probably 75, 80,000 indoors. Big, big place. The Carrier speaks for itself. It's the Carrier yeah. air conditioning mm-hmm. people. Anyway, Syracuse is playing Notre Dame. Notre Dame's having just a very, very average Yeah, I really haven't heard a lot about the uh, Fighting Irish this year. because they aren't very good. (laughs) Syracuse is having a great year. A magnificent comeback year. They took Clemson right to the wire last week, did lose a game. Syracuse listed as a three-point favorite, and that one should be a lot of fun. Now, a game in which Mike the Intern will have a whole lot of I was waiting for you to bring it up. And it will be a dandy. It's in Manhattan, Kansas. K-State taking on Oklahoma State. And Still don't know who the starting quarterback is going to be, which well, is I, unfortunate. I, Martinez will be in there. You he's, think it's going to be him? He's a tough guy. He's uh, been through the injury process on many, when he was at Nebraska. He's a transfer. Mm-hmm. Transfer portal. Yeah, yeah. Coming down from the Huskers, didn't have a whole lot of success there, but a good player. I think he'll be in there. Kansas State listed as a one-and-a-half point favorite. Really? And then you have what's a traditional rivalry. Tennessee is having a magnificent oh, year. Yeah. Tennessee may be a Final Four team if things work out. They <laughs> still have all, uh, they still have Georgia to play in Georgia. But Tennessee is playing Kentucky at Nayland Stadium in Knoxville, Tennessee. They'll have also well over 100,000 fans. That is a traditional rivalry. Kentucky-Tennessee has been going on for a century and a half. Tennessee, a couple touchdown favorite in that one, but watch out. The Kentucky Wildcats can play. That's just a, a smidgen of the big games going on. Yeah, I think you're right, though. Tennessee might be Final Four this year. They They're have good. just been monsters. But, man, there's some tough competition at the top, and it's college football, and you never know what's going to happen. All right, Mizzou. Not having such a great year. Arkansas, not bad, but uh, what are the odds on their games? They both are playing on the Now, get this. Missouri is playing in Columbia. <laughs> but it's not Columbia, Missouri. It's Columbia, South Carolina. And they're playing the Gamecocks of South Carolina, Spencer Rattler and company. And South Carolina, after a shaky start, has come on and is listed as a five-point choice over Missouri. At game on the road in Columbia, South Carolina. Arkansas also on the road at Jordan-Hare Stadium in Auburn, Alabama. And the Razorbacks are a three-and-a-half-point choice over the Auburn Tigers. Auburn is having a really shaky year, and the <laughs> constituency down there wants Brian Harson, their coach, gone out of there. Well, Arkansas will try to contribute to that. Razorbacks should win, but playing at Auburn is always awfully tough. It is, but you're right, though. There's a lot of great college, college football going on Saturday, and I don't have anything going on at all except for watching college football. Well, wait a minute. Wait just a minute. You are an alum of Missouri State. It is homecoming at Missouri Mm -hmm. State. The Bears are playing Western Illinois in a 2 o'clock game. No, neither team is having a great year at all, but it is college football. So I'll come down and have a drink with you before the game, and then I'm going to go home and watch Wildcat game because... 
I want to watch K-State, Iowa, or K-State, Oklahoma State. I just I got to. We will be on the south side of the stadium I'm, in I'm, the parking uh, lot, and uh, there will be some. I just have a I just have a, a call for Ned, and then he responds. <laughs> it's kind of like uh, one of those nature shows. All right, uh, tomorrow night, high school district football playoffs begin, and there are some really good games in that one as well. District games, very interesting the way the format works now, and I do like this. I think it's the proper way to determine a state champion. Each team plays 10 games, but when you look at number 10, there's no opponent on the schedule. That's because it's the start of district play, and the teams in each district are all seated by a committee and by their records, of course. Most of the districts have eight teams, so you have number one playing number eight and two playing seven and so forth and so on. In the districts where there are uneven numbers of teams, then the number one seeds get a bye. Number one and number two get a, get an off week. That doesn't happen with all of them, certainly not. But here in town, we have some great games coming up. But this is number 10, and this is the key because final game for the losers, sayonara, you're out of there. For the winners, a district game two next week, and then a district three game, then these quarterfinals, semifinals, and the state championship right around Thanksgiving weekend and into December and I think we have some very capable teams in I Southwest Missouri. I think it'll be a very interesting set, but it all begins tomorrow night. Yeah, and it's a long road, especially when you've been in that position and you know all the weeks you got to dominate. It's tough, but hopefully we'll have some good representation this year. I just could not believe my eyes and ears late afternoon yesterday when I got word that Wayno's coming back, man. That's so that's so awesome. I think he planned on that all along anyway. Just kind of playing things out, maybe to see how his damaged knee repaired and so forth. That's why he had what was called a dead arm. That's an excuse that a lot of pitchers use, but he alleges that his dead arm was caused by the fact that he had to change his motion after getting hit in the knee with a line drive in August. Well, it may or may not be the case. You have to look at the records, though, when Wainwright finished the final five weeks of the season under 500 and was with an earned run average of over seven points. That's not Adam Wainwright. He is coming back. He feels like he should pitch. His family says, hey, we, we want you to go back and try it again, and the Cardinals are certainly more than willing. They need, they being the Cardinals, need on their pitching staff some veteran who's been around a long time, and this will be Wainwright's 19th year in the majors. 18th year with the Cardinals, and that's a long time. He's a mainstay. So yes, from that standpoint, if he's able to regain that big old Uncle Charlie curveball, and he throws a bender, he, <laughs> he's, he is very good at doing that. If he can get all that rhythm back and pitch well throughout the season, then yes, he'll be a welcome addition back. And from a coaching standpoint, having him in, in there will definitely help. Leadership yeah. and coaching. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and that was something else I was going to ask you. We were talking about Skip yesterday going down to the Marlins, right? And the other coaches that just decided not to come back. You think they're going to follow him down to South to Florida? That's you a think, good question. See, you know what I mean? Because sometimes that happens if, hey, well, I'm going here. The coaches you're talking about are the hitting coach and the pitching mm-hmm. coach. The hitting coach is Jeff Albert. And the pitching coach is Mike Maddox, uh, both of whom have a lot of experience, although Mr. Albert, the hitting coach, has come under a lot of criticism as well. But both of those guys were offered contracts. They both decided not to come back. Now, why did they decide not to come back? It could very well be they're headed with Skip Schumacher. That I don't know. But I do know the Cardinals will need a new hitting coach and a new pitching coach. And as far as the hitting coach is concerned, it may very well be we'll find out a guy i interviewed about three weeks well it'll be about six weeks ago now matt holiday oh he would be a candidate yeah he would it. be he's he is reportedly conversed with the cardinals about getting a position back right now he's an assistant coach at oklahoma state and when i interviewed him at the diamond dinner on the diamond uh, i said hey you'll be over there in that dugout across the first base side at hammond state he said yeah oklahoma state plays up here this year May or may not be. We'll see what happens. And he might be wearing a different uniform in that building, too. We'll see what <laughs> happens there. But, yeah, I uh, heard that Mo offered those guys to return, but they said no. So that made me think, well, maybe they're going to skip or maybe they got a better opportunity somewhere else in the league. you always got to be moving up somehow in this thing. All right, so <sighs> I made a joke about this when they, when they got to this point, the Phillies winning the championship, and – 
I said, you know what? We need to start a GoFundMe for Ned. <laughs> Fly his ass out east so he can go see a game at uh, in Philadelphia, his boyhood team. I mean, I'm sure the Phillies are like the Chiefs are to me, to you. Would you go? If there's a GoFundMe, you bet. <laughs> Damn it, I should have started it. <laughs> Do you know what the ticket price is? I'm going to guess this, the low end, probably two, two, three grand. The high end average, <clears throat> the average ticket is $3,200. Yeah. $3,200, that's the second highest in history oh, yeah. for a World Series ticket. In Philly? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, Philly's going to boost them up. It's the first time in 11 years they've been to the World Series. Okay. 3200 for the average. Now, there are ticket prices that are higher than that in your prime seats and lower than that for standing room. Standing room is $1,100 yeah. per ticket. The average ticket in Houston for the World Series, the average is about 1500 So it's twice as much in Philadelphia. It's because they're, they don't go there every year. All right, $3,200, one game, one ticket. Hell no. How <laughs> much as I love the team, I watch them on TV. He should have started that GoFundMe. <laughs> heavens, yes, you should have. Uh, I, I will tell you that back in 1964 when I was in the Navy, I was in a circumstance where I could have gone to the World Series had the Phil, uh, Phillies been there. They blew it in the final week of the season. But, uh, yes, the tickets, oh, my gosh, they were what fifty dollars a ticket oh, or something? God, nothing. Like that. Yeah. That, and of course, we're talking sixty years ago. But now, thirty-two hundred dollars a ticket. Here's your question: What's the highest ever? You know who has the highest ticket price for a World Series? Now, keep in mind, probably the Royals. Uh, no, no. There's one higher than that. Okay. Now, keep in mind now. There's a lot of it's based on how often a team. Yeah, that's what I was thinking of when they finally uh, went you're back. Missing the obvious one. The Chicago yeah, Cubs. Yeah, yeah, the Cubbies. Yeah, that's right. $6,100 a ticket Whew. at Wrigley Field in 2015, 2016, I guess it was, when the Cubs played. And that is a lot of money. Dude. <laughs> buy a car. Right and walk right, rock right up, hand a guy six grand and get a car. Really nice one, too. Well, right now, I don't know, but still, it's still a lot of money. And like you I you know, like you said, sometimes it's just better to watch it at home. And just looking at the forecast, the weather forecast here, first two games, which are tomorrow night and Saturday night, it's going to rain. Bless the dome. But it's raining yep. in Houston yep. where the roof will be closed. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> yep, yep. And it's probably a good thing that you're at home so you can, you know, put on your boyhood Phillies uniform and sit there and scream into a pillow when it's not going your way. I'll be doing other things. Yeah, I know you will, Ned. I'll see you tomorrow, man. <laughs>